Well, good morning to our viewers in the United States and good afternoon to our viewers in Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany. Thank you for joining us today. For decades, the American Council on Germany has had a special focus on bringing together German decision makers at the local level to collaborate and to share best practices. Our hope is that through the active exchange of ideas and experiences, these practitioners can work together to develop policy solutions to common challenges. The ACG has often hosted mayors and other local government officials, but this year we have launched a new initiative titled Virtual Transatlantic Town Halls, German American Mayors Forum. This series is designed to engage the mayors of German and American so that they can discuss current issues confronting their respective cities and how they are preparing for the future. Today's event is being held as part of Wunderbar Together USA 2020, a comprehensive and collaborative initiative funded by the German Federal Foreign Office and implemented by the Goethe Institute. And we're delighted to partner with the World Affairs Council of Charlotte to bring you this discussion. The World Affairs Council of Charlotte is happy to support the reestablishment of the Charlotte Sister <coughs> Cities Association through events like this. Unfortunately, the mayor of Charlotte, Vi Lyles, had a last minute conflict and is unable to join us today. But I'm pleased that Mayor Pro Tem Julie Eiseld is able to join us on short notice. Welcome. And I'm delighted to welcome the Oberbürgermeister or Lord Mayor of Krefeld, Frank Meyer. Herzlich Hello. willkommen. Danke. Hello. Since we only have a, an hour together, let me keep my introductions brief. Originally from Krefeld, Frank Meyer has been politically active in the Social Democratic Party, or SPD, since 1992. He was elected to Krefeld's city council in 1999 and served as deputy mayor from 2009 to 2015. He's in his second term as the mayor of Krefeld. Julie Eiselt and her husband moved to Charlotte in 1998 to work and raise their four children. She had never envisioned a role in public office until a man tried to abduct her at gunpoint in 2007. This led her to found Neighbors for a Safer Charlotte to advocate for a for court system resources and policies to make all Charlotte residents safer. She then ran successfully for Charlotte City Council in 2015 and is in her third term on the council, serving at large and as mayor pro tem. Driven by the city's common histories as leaders in the textile industry, in 1986, the then mayors of Krefeld and Charlotte established a sister city relationship to enhance the ties between the two cities and to promote educational, cultural, and changes. Since the 1980s, the textile industry in both countries has experienced significant decline, and this has caused both cities to undergo periods of significant structural change. Today, we'd like to talk about how both cities have managed the structural change and also how you're coping with the current challenges resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. Charlotte has become a hub for both banking and for the energy sector. It is the second largest banking center in the United States after New York City, and there are more than 240 companies directly tied to the energy sector. Manufacturing still plays a role in the local community, but it is smaller relative to these other sectors. Mayor Pro Tem Eiseld, can you walk us through how Charlotte made this transition from a textile center to a really vibrant hub for Banji and what sort of an impact this has had on the city? Sure, thanks, Steve. Well, as Charlotte, as uh, locally we know it, it's um, the city of the New South. I think that being a quote, newer city in this country uh, gives us the ability to pivot a little bit easier. So as you mentioned, we started, our history goes back to being a textile and manufacturing center 
um, early on, we were selected to be, because of our, our locality, we were selected to be um, a center for the railroads. Um, it, the Civil War had a, quite an impact on us in terms of our locality as well. And because of our, our uh, central location, and we still are very much positioned very well from a manufacturing standpoint as well, Charlotte being sort of in the center of both South Carolina and North Carolina. Um, and with the interstate highway system, we still are very, um, the transportation industry is also very important to Charlotte. Banking kind of evolved really because of um, the pivot away from the textile and manufacturing industry. Of course, banking was here and, and was able to finance those industries but we really saw a big change in the 90s as more banks started to look at Charlotte, found it a place, that, uh, found it a place to be that they could uh, affordably open up locations down here. Uh, because of our state's higher education system, we had a lot of very talented local, uh, a, a talented local labor force. And I think that's really still true today. We are constantly, as local government, we are constantly trying to find ways to pivot, making the most of our educational system in the state and in the region, but also of what industries such as energy, banking, uh, manufacturing, what industries that we can um, train our people to be able to be ready for the jobs of tomorrow. So I think that that's been the mindset of Charlotte and of Charlotteans, many of whom are from other places, uh, is such that we're, we're ready to pivot and take advantage of the change in industries. So I've had the opportunity to, to visit the Levine Museum of the New South, and um, it does an excellent job of presenting how the region has really undergone this change, but it also, in some of its ex exhibits, has pointed out um, some of the social inequities uh, that have existed in Charlotte and in the region in the past. Can you talk a little bit about how the structural change has impacted the urban development in Charlotte and how some of the, the social inequities um, have, have perhaps become exacerbated as a result? Mm -hmm. Sure. So I think, you know, Charlotte, when you, when you look at some of the inequities that came out of um, after World War II, uh, opportunities for employment uh, were really went to a lot of veterans um, that, white veterans, frankly, the housing market developed after the war uh, and opportunities were not there for people of color. And Charlotte, um, we have a history with Brooklyn Village, which you probably learned a bit about at the museum. We have a we have very physical evidence of the inequities that existed in this city. But when we took Brooklyn Village, which was a very vibrant home to African American families, and we we removed it so that we could build government center and the center of our uh, court system and our civic life in Charlotte, and we moved those neighborhoods beyond what now is the 277 infrastructure. So we have very visible and tangible, tangible, tangible evidence of those inequities. And that is um, every day is a reminder to us of what we've got to do to give people opportunities and to frankly make up for some of those, um, those inequities and give people opportunities to um, accumulate wealth like people did that were able to live in the center city or closer into Charlotte and purchase homes. We still have neighborhoods in, in Charlotte that still have written into the deed restrictions that families of color could not live there. Of course, those are not um, legally binding at all, but our, our recent history is very much alive in our minds. When we talk about how we uh, transition to new industries, how we educate people, the kinds of jobs that we need here that are not only accessible to people that have some barriers to employment, but also our high wage gr uh, growth industries, such as um, uh, distribution and logistics, manufacturing, uh, and even banking to a certain extent. When you, when you talk about really training people to overcome the digital divide, there's a lot of jobs in the FinTech industry, 
that people that um, have that kind of aptitude, we can train them to get good paying jobs without a college degree. Thank you. Uh, I'd now like to bring Mayor Meyer into the conversation. Um, the, the success of the, the velvet and silk textile industries made Krefeld one of the richest cities in Germany in the late 19th century. How did Krefeld adapt to the decline of the textile industry? And perhaps more importantly, how has Krefeld drawn on its history to continue its economic development today? We are very proud of our history as um, um, the so-called city of silk and velvet. And um, it's not only a, a question of um, business and industries and money, it's a question of culture, of um, um, the, the feeling of the um, people in, in Krefeld, uh, how, we, uh, how we think about ourselves and uh, what is special in our city. But uh, you're right. Um, um, once upon a time, every second employee in Krefeld worked in the textile industry and in the textile business. And uh, it's uh, very hard to see that we lost almost all of these jobs uh, over the last decades. But um, with the textile, um, the chemical industry came to Krefeld because we had to, to color the um, um, Stoffe, <laughs> you know what I mean? And um, then we had the manufacturing um, also as a follow-up of uh, the textile industry and um, manufacturing and uh, chemical industry uh, are still very, very important for uh, local businesses, for uh, employment in Krefeld, but as other big um, uh, cities in North Westphalia in our region that are um, uh, that were very strong in industry. We have a problem with unemployment. Uh, we have a had a rate um, of about 10% uh, unemployment in our city. A few weeks ago, that was a very good number, <laughs> the best within the last 20 years. But then um, with the um, COVID uh, pan pandemic, we had um, we have now have stronger um, numbers in unemployment. Um, today, we are a city with um, a lot of smaller businesses. Um, we have logistics and uh, transportation. In our city, we have um, the university in Krefeld um, as a university of applied science. Um, we uh, have a very good um, co-working with our neighbors in the Netherlands. We are very, very close to the, to the Dutch border. Our um, sister city in the Netherlands, Venlo, is only 40 kilometers away from Krefeld, so um, we live in a very strong region and um, we uh, get very good along with co-working with the partners here. So when you became mayor in 2015, you helped start an initiative called Krefelder Perspektivwechsel, Krefeld Neudenken, or changing the perspective on Krefeld and thinking new about Krefeld. This initiative was supposed to culminate with the city's 650th birthday in 2023. Can you talk a little bit about the initiative, about the awareness campaign and, and what it's meant for the city? Um, I don't know what it's like in the United States and what it's like in Charlotte, but um, the citizens of Krefeld sometimes um, don't speak very good about their own city. So I. You know, the, the grass on the other side of the fence is greener than in your own yard. And um, we, we said we want to, to stop it. And we want to give the, our own people a chance to get a new um, perspective on our city. So it's a change of perspective where we wanted to start um, as a kind of um, marketing campaign where we are not um, trying to find a new slogan for the city and um, where we don't um, address to people outside the city. We, um, we do our city's marketing um, as addressing to our own people to make them all ambassadors of our city. That is the idea behind it. And um, as you said, we have uh, our uh, anniversary in 2023. So every second year up to then, we have a special um, um, theme for a year, for example, to... Um, to look on our city from, um, from the top when we go on very high buildings or from the bottom when we go down to the, um, 
canalization, <laughs> for example, to give new perspectives on the city um, just from the point of view directly or um, indirectly when we um, um, look to our very, very proud history um, in architecture, for example, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, the last director of the Bauhaus, um, he um, planned two very um, important houses here in Krefeld. Um, these houses today are um, part of our um, uh, Museum of Arts, where we have a lot of uh, exhibitions. And we uh, try to give the people of Krefeld a, a feeling what, what happened here over the years in, in the past, um, what is very special in our city and very interesting is almost everything in Krefeld that is important has to do something with silk and velvet at the end. And Mayor Pro Tem Eiselt, I want to uh, maybe follow up on that. Uh, everybody I've met from Charlotte is incredibly proud of Charlotte. Um, and yet I'm sure that there might be sentiments also of some criticism that um, Mayor Meyer was, was talking about um, when, when thinking about one's home community. Um, do you want to respond to the mayor's question about what the, the atmosphere is like in Charlotte? Sure. So I think Mayor Meyer is right that sometimes we are our own biggest critics. Um, we did celebrate last year, we're babies compared to the people of Krefeld, but we had our 250th anniversary of Charlotte last year that we celebrated. And um, it, we, in honor of that, we planted 250 trees, which is one of the things that we did because we do like to be known uh, for our tree canopy in Charlotte. Um, I think that right now, a lot of the social justice issues that are happening do point out um, that although we are a, a wonderful city that I do think provides opportunity to um, a lot of different people in a way that a lot of sort of older American cities might not. They, they're not always as welcoming as I think Charlotte is, but we also have to hold a spotlight to ourselves to make sure that while we're welcoming new people to Charlotte, we have uh, new jobs, new types of jobs. We've got to remember that the people that are here that built this city need those opportunities as well. So we can't really truly be a welcoming city that offers opportunity to everyone if we're not thinking about the people who have lived here for generations and were a great part of building this wonderful city. I think that's an important point for, for, for a lot of the cities that I'm familiar with, both in, in Germany and uh, um, to not forget the, the history, even as one tries to, to welcome new, new inputs. I'd like to maybe shift gears a little bit. It's, it's come up a rotation and, and it's, it's almost impossible to have any conversation these days without talking about COVID-19. And I'd like to, to ask you both about how your cities have handled the challenges posed by the pandemic um, and, and maybe even give us a little bit of a, a status report on how your cities are doing in terms of the pandemic, what some of the biggest challenges have been over the last few months and what the, the prospect is as we enter flu season and weather. Mayor Pratem Eisel, let me start with you. Um, you, you touched on it a little bit, um, some of the, the um, attention that social inequity is getting now. Uh, is definitely tied to the simultaneous public health, economic, and social justice crises that are, that are unfolding. How has that played out in Charlotte, and how has the local government responded to these very different but very significant challenges? Right. So, and I, perhaps Mayor Meyer will agree with me, but I think that the pandemic has um, magnified what the weaknesses were in our civic um, fabric, if you will, from the beginning. So if we talk about um, accessing healthcare, if we talk about um, people that have health insurance, those who don't have been greatly impacted to a much larger degree in, in our city and other cities. Um, and, and we see now the bigger, the bigger gap that we have to fill with be, be it healthcare, access to education, access to internet. Uh, that, the, the challenge for us in Charlotte is that we have um, 
we're, even though we're the 15th largest city, most cities in the, in the country have the health department under their city operations. We don't. Our county manages our public health and our city um, is really more of our infrastructure. So the health, we rely on the health department right now to get the information out. Oftentimes people think it's the mayor that is making those decisions. It's really not. It's our governor, our county health department, our county health director. On the city side, we have been more focused on our business community. Um, we uh, spent $50 million of our CARES Act money on a, a grant program for our small businesses. We also combined with other, um, with the county ha has had small business programs and the private sector has as well. So even though our $50 million grant program really tried to, um, to target the companies that did not get PPP, even though we, we could not do that, we made sure uh, that we had navigators in the community that were helping those companies be ready to apply for these grants when they opened up. We then uh, uh, started a small grant program to focus on the industries that are most important to our economy right now, the hospitality industry, uh, the entertainment industry. Um, we recently just did a small grant program for, our, for music venues, so arts and culture. So we have been also targeting our CARES Act assistance for the industries that are most important to keep um, Charlotte thriving and, and to really help the people that it employs. Thank you. Um, and Mayor Meyer, um, from my vantage past, uh, Germany seems to have, have fared better during the first wave of the pandemic, um, but there's now a, a second wave and, and even an uptick in cases in Krefeld, as, as you mentioned to me before we went live. Um, and yet prior today, I had read that, that Krefeld um, really had kept its number of cases very, very low um, with just 120 cases at the moment and a total of, of about a thousand cases since the pandemic began. How have you managed um, the, the pandemic? First, I think um, <clears throat> Germany did very well in taking um, this crisis very serious from the beginning on. And we started very early to uh, protect our people by um, uh, really hard decisions we had in, uh, uh, in spring. Um, so this, um, um, <clears throat> by this, we had, we had a very low first wave. Now the second wave is uh, much stronger that we, um, that we have to, that we are faced um, uh, by now. But um, I think we uh, did a lot of things very, very well to get along with it. When you talk about um, COVID in, in, in Germany and in, in Krefeld, I think you have to, um, you have, I think three main topics uh, you have to talk about. The first is um, everything about health. Um, in Germany, um, we are lucky that everybody um, has um, health protection and um, that you have your uh, health insurance. So we don't have this big social problem with people that are left uh, on their own in this crisis. So um, this uh, minimum is for everybody here and that makes uh, the work for the local government much more easy easy than um, I think it could be in Charlotte when I hear what uh, my colleague is, uh, is uh, saying. Um, we are very strong with our hospitals. We, uh, from the beginning on, we are in a weekly talks with them and um, we, uh, we are um, very careful to, um, to have enough um, beds in the hospitals than uh, when uh, we have an increasing number of uh, people infected that they um, can go to a local hospital. So we are very fine about this. This is um, one thing. What is um, a problem is the um, local health administration because we don't have enough uh, offices in these departments, um, in the city's administration, because it's uh, our first uh, pandemic. So we, um, uh, we uh, don't have expected that we have to do so much work. Now at the moment, we have a lot of um, people from other departments that are sent to the health department to, to pro, um, 
to support the colleagues over there, but it's really hard. Um, at the moment, we um, try to get um, some support by the federal government for, um, for handling the cases that we have to handle in our local administration. The second big topic is um, the uh, economic um, um, impact of um, COVID for our city. Uh, it's uh, very, very hard for people, for example, in the travel businesses because nobody travels uh, abroad. So a lot of people um, are, um, are in a very, very, very bad economic situation there of people that um, have restaurants or pubs or um, other people um, having to do with culture and events and so on. We have some, um, um, some supports by the federal uh, government and by, uh, by the state's government, but uh, all this money is not enough to help all these people get along. Um, we, um, as the city, give a little bit money too, but uh, this will um, be one of the biggest tasks in the, in the next weeks to help these people not to lose their, their jobs. It's uh, um, for them a very, very critical situation at the moment. And um, the third topic is um, what does all this with our society um, and what is the social question behind it? For example, um, when you have um, kids in, um, in very good educated families with lots of money and um, um, a lot of resources for the kids at home, they can get along with it much better than people that are um, in a, living on a poor level where the, uh, the kids that don't have um, the hardware to go um, to take part in um, digital, digital schooling and so on. Um, we, um, at the moment, we um, buy the hardware to give it to the, um, to the poorer people and um, to give the um, schools the opportunity to do um, this uh, digital schooling. So, um, and the other thing is um, a lot of people are very alone in these days. And it's uh, very hard to find um, a way to bring people together because they don't, uh, they should separate uh, on one hand and on the other hand in such a crisis, uh, you need um, the other one. You need um, people around you. Yeah? You need someone to, to speak with. And um, yeah, we will have to, to bring the people together um, without um, being infected by each other. I think that's the, the challenge of our age, right? How do we come together and maintain social distance at the, at the same time. I'd like to ask you one follow-up question, Mayor Meyer, before um, turning to, to the digital divide that, that both of you have touched on. Um, Mayor Pertem Eisold uh, talked a little bit of governor um, of North Carolina versus uh, the, the local government in, in Charlotte. Can you maybe talk a little bit about um, the, the role of the Minister President in, in North Rhine Westphalia versus your role as mayor? Um, how, mu how much uh, influence does the, the Minister President have in, in policies or directives that you might come up with for the city? That is really a hard question to answer. Um, at the moment, it, in Germany, it goes like this. Um, the, the Chancellor, um, Ms. Merkel, um, uh, has meetings with the Minister President of the States, with the political leaders of the States, and they um, have a political discussion with a political decision, but these political decisions are not rules for the people to follow. These rules have to be um, um, discussed and uh, at the end made by the federal government. So Mr. Laschet as Minister President of North West Fine and uh, his ministers ha have to take the decisions in the end. And um, the problem is that uh, a lot of uh, decisions are, have, uh, have to be taken by the local authorities. So the local health authority is the one who has to decide um, to to close the special um, uh, company down or to, to close the school or to send people to, um, or, or, um, to tell people to stay at home and so on. This is a local decision, but the frame for it is made by the, by the government in Dusseldorf in our state. Thank you. And North, North uh, you both touched on, sorry. 
I, I just want to say right. that um, um, in, in Germany, we are a federal state. So um, from time to time, we have um, the political situation that the um, the governments of the single states um, are kind of um, rivals to each other to be um, better in handling the crisis. And I think that is not a very good um, situation because the people um, need um, clear rules. They have to um, to orientate and uh, such a um, situation like we have now is um, not very good for political games. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, you you've both touched on um, the the fact that there's income inequality um, and that that has sort of exacerbated the digital divide uh, in some parts of your community, both in terms of education, but also in terms of people's ability to to work from home. Um, and I'd like to ask you both to maybe talk about how your communities are trying to close the, the digital divide and what some of your priorities are around funding um, for this. I, Mayor Meyer talked about providing hardware, that that's something that's also happening in the, the Charlotte area. Uh, but one of the things that one reads about is that even if one has the hardware, uh, people don't necessarily have the broadband access or the internet access. Often the hardware is shared by several people in a family, which um, makes it very difficult for everybody in that family to be um, keeping up with their schoolwork or, or doing work from home as they can. How are each of your cities trying to, to tackle some of these challenges? Well, um, I'll go first. Um, in Charlotte, as I mentioned before, we have a division between city and county. So the schools are under our county. And normally in normal times, we don't really cross the line and fund education. Sometimes we'll help with school resource. Well, we do fund school resource officers, but we, we all pretty much stay in our lanes for the most part. However, as, as I mentioned, I think the pandemic has really highlighted the inequities in the community. And so it's hard to ignore the, the problem that school children have we have 16,000 children just in our school district who did not have internet access at home. So um, the CMS Foundation started a campaign to raise $4 million to buy the hotspot devices, but also provide internet uh, connectivity for the whole school year. And we did, the city recognized how important that is to the overall health, economic and, and personal emotional health of our community, we recognize how important it is for children not to fall further behind in their education. And so we did use a million dollars of our CARES Act money to provide the internet connectivity. So we know that some homes need more than one of those hotspots. It's hard to have a child, more than uh, two students in a home use one hotspot. So some of those, um, so 16,000 isn't exactly the number of households some of those households will get more than one device. We've also provided um, money for what we call Access Charlotte. So we put a million and a half dollars into public Wi-Fi infrastructure. Um, we have equipped, I think all, a, a lot of our public buses with internet connectivity um, and provided more hotspots in what we're calling learning labs. We're partnering with the United Way of Central Carolinas to have learning labs for children whose parents can't be at home during the day, which is a lot of parents. And so they need a place to go while they're still in a remote um, learning mode. And then at the state level, the, the governor launched a, a grant program for rural counties to provide broadband, broadband infrastructure. And that's going to reach about 8,000 families. But for our efforts here in Charlotte, we should be in a good position that no child um, should not have access to internet connectivity while they're at home. There has been a problem finding kids though and finding families and constantly the school district is learning about families, uh, especially in our Hispanic community that uh, might be afraid to reach out or don't have the language skills to be able to understand the communications as to how to get their students connected. But that's a very 
very positive response in terms of how forward leaning the city has been. Um, Mayor Meyer, any, any thoughts on how to close the digital divide? Yes, we, um, even before um, we had this uh, COVID situation, we've been in a, in a process uh, of <clears throat> digital change in, in all over Germany, all over Europe, I think worldwide and even in Krefeld. Um, so, so we had the discussion about um, getting a better um, digital infrastructure in the city, um, how to get um, a better access to the, to the business areas, uh, even for the schools. These discussions uh, had all been there before um, COVID started. And um, we, um, we've seen over the last uh, weeks that um, these discussions became stronger and that we did a lot to, to, be, to be much faster in solving the problems. Um, but there are still some problems left um, because we don't get the, the cables to the houses in, in the short time. But we, we are working hard on it. We, um, as I said, we, we bought um, equipment for, for the schools and for the kids. Um, this is uh, a lot of um, work for the people in the administration uh, to buy all this stuff and to bring it to the people what we are doing our best. And to, uh, what we saw is that things things that we never thought we could do quickly, we've done very, very quickly. So we are much better than we thought ourselves. Um, when I see how many people are um, working from home at the moment, um, that were in the companies, um, even here in, uh, in the city's uh, administration, we said, no, that's not possible to work um, from home. Yes, it is possible if you want to. So um, maybe this is one of the things um, that we can say we are stronger in this uh, very critical situation than we thought uh, that we were. We've had a, a number of questions come in um, specifically about sister city relationships and yeah. um, about the ties between Charlotte and Krefeld, but also elsewhere. And I'd like to, to maybe spend a little bit of time talking about the sister city relationship uh, per se. But before we dive into that, I have a, a question for Mayor Meyer from somebody in Philadelphia who's near Krefeld Street, spelt with a C, not with a K, um, who writes, you mentioned having a good working relationship across the border with the Netherlands, especially with Venlo. Because of sea level rises, uh, or because of sea level rise, some Dutch architects and climate scientists expect a major population shift toward the eastern part of the country. Do you think this might lead to more intense cross-border cooperation on issues like infrastructure, employment, and housing between the Netherlands and Germany? That is a very, very good question. <laughs> um, first of all, um, it's very good to hear from Philadelphia, um, where we have a um, a special uh, relation to from Krefeld. Um, but let's talk about Fenno first. Um, um, as I said, uh, Fenno and Krefeld are um, <clears throat> in a neighborhood. It's uh, about 40 kilometers, I think, from an American perspective. It's, uh, it's very, very close. And uh, it's, a, it's a good um, base to have um, a sister city that is uh, in the neighborhood. And um, uh, Fenlo is um, very, very strong in um, um, sustainable uh, development um, and they um, have very, very good ideas for um, building um, public, uh, for creating public buildings and uh, being uh, very responsible in, in questions of climate and environment and so on. And uh, we are um, co-working uh, at the moment. We have a I uh, have projects um, with Fenlo and other uh, German cities uh, along the border. And um, for us, it's, uh, it's um, very, very interesting uh, to have these uh, co-workings and it's making us better. We can learn a lot, of, a lot from them. They have very good ideas that we can um, copy uh, here in, in Germany or find a way to do it a little bit like them. And I think um, to learn from each other, like uh, um, it's your idea for, um, for um, meetings like this we're having here. We have the same uh, with our friends in the Netherlands and with very concrete uh, results at the end. 
So jumping off of, of the relationship between Krefeld and it, your sister city in the Netherlands, um, one of our viewers is, is curious to know what Charlotte and Krefeld are doing to strengthen the relationship and partnership between your two cities moving forward. Is there anything in the works that, that people should know about? I think um, um, in 2021, we um, have a little anniversary with uh, 35 years of uh, partnership between Charlotte and uh, Krefeld. And um, um, when um, the partnership started, it was, it was um, a result of a very big celebration in Germany that um, for um, 300 years um, German or that 300 years ago German families um, went um, to the United States um, and um, have been the first German settlers in the New World um, and founded um, German German, German town uh, which is a part of Philadelphia today and. Um, um, we had a very big celebration here in Krefeld with um, the um, federal chancellor and the um, federal president and uh, George Bush, father, who was vice president of Ronald Reagan at that time and visited Krefeld. So we're still very proud um, of this visit. And um, after all the celebrations, um, there was the very strong wish to, to not only have a, a relationship between um, our countries, but also between a city, a Krefeld and a, and a city in the United States, because um, if you want to, to have a good base for a friendship, it uh, can uh, not only be ordered by the governments, it has to be lived by the people. Um, after a very good start of, uh, our, um, uh, of our friendship with um, a lot of school contacts, um, um, it became a little bit, um, sleepy over over the years and um, I think now with the anniversary next year and um, when we're facing that we have the same problems all over the world and that we need each other to solve the problems for example COVID will not be um, solved by the United States um, by themselves or by Germany or Europe ourselves we have to to co-work to be responsible for the people um, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. So uh, I think we should um, use this anniversary next year to, to get a, a kickoff or a restart of our relationship. I hope that we will have a chance to, to visit each other. I would like to do that and that we can, um, can bring, um, first of all, our schools together because um, it's a very, very good chance for the young people to, um, to visit um, the other city, um, the other country to get their own impressions. I think um, a lot of young Americans would be um, very surprised when they see what Germany is really like and uh, maybe in, in difference to what they think about. And um, the other way, I know exactly that, uh, that it's so that um, the United States and uh, Charlotte, which is a fantastic city, can is, is um, uh, completely different than what you know from TV when you have only um, um, an uh, impression of the United States by the media. It's much better to have an impression by yourself and uh, our cities should do what we can to bring people together. Well, Mayor Meyer, you speak from personal experience because I do. you visited <laughs> Charlotte, you were a high school student and had the opportunity to live with two host families um, right. then visited you and, and your family in Germany afterwards. But as you, you mentioned before we, we started today, it's, it's been a while since you've been back in Charlotte. And um, I, I certainly hope that, that today's call can, can help reinvigorate um, some of the relationship between these two sister cities. Um, Mayor, I'd I'd like to maybe ask you a, a similar question to the one that that I had that um, Mayor Meyer just just answered. Um, how can these kinds of relationships between Krefeld and Charlotte support and advance um, both cities as we move further into the 21st century? So yeah, uh, it's a great question, and I um, I think that as we see. 
um, global trade changing and you hear a lot about supply chains are gonna be changing, trading partners are gonna be changing. It's even more critical that we strengthen the bonds with our existing partners like Charlotte has with Crefeld, like we do with the over 300 companies in the Charlotte region that have uh, Austrian, Swiss and German roots. Two thirds of those have actual German roots. And so those companies have been critical to us to grow the presence of um, our, our um, international businesses here in Charlotte. And I think that if anything that the pandemic has taught us, it's how important the people to people exchanges are and the bonds between people. I think we're all starting to feel the stress a little bit of Zoom calls and um, conducting business online and we miss those connections and we realize how valuable they are. So um, I know that American Airlines is keen to get their business back um, on track for Europe. I believe that um, the, their flights to Munich and Frankfurt are expected to return hopefully in uh, March of 2021. Uh, we had a cargo flight going to Munich that had to be suspended but they, American has put a priority on Charlotte and Dallas in particular as their major hubs. And so they have prioritized flights, both passenger and cargo flights through Charlotte. And so as we think forward about what our critical, who our critical trade partners are and where our critical relationships are, I think it's even more important that we reinvigorate those relationships at all levels, even down to the youth level um, with um, when it's possible again, high school exchanges and things like that. Um, and that's going to be, um, that's going to be really important for the economic and cultural health of both of our communities, I believe. And the sister cities program. Just One of our effort to do that. So one of our, our viewers um, here in the US is, is curious whether the city of Charlotte dedicates funding um, from its budget to work with, with Krefeld. That, um, we, I mean, we do have our, we have departments that work with our sister cities. I don't, I don't know specifically for Krefeld, um, but it is, it's certainly, if there is a program that we are initiating, certainly if it's a priority of the council to do that, we could. Um, my background is international banking and trade, and I think it's an area that Charlotte really could um, optimize. We are very well positioned from a transportation standpoint, as I mentioned, um, to, to be the premier inland uh, port in the southeast. So I think it's something that I'd love to see the city of Charlotte prioritize from a global trade standpoint. And the best way to do that is to start with our sister city program and find out where those natural ties exist. And certainly with Krefeld and with Germany, that, that would be one of the best candidates. And, and perhaps a question for both of you, because I think that this is interesting for, for anybody that follows sister city relationships writ large, but how does one define success of a sister city relationship. I mean, you've talked a little bit about people to people exchanges. Obviously that's something that's, that's challenging right now, um, but there will be a time after the pandemic when we can have those kinds of, of people to people exchanges. Uh, I, I think important to, and you touched on this, Mayor Pro Tem Iselt, um, it's, it's not just the, the cultural and student exchanges, but also really sort of the economic ties um, that one, one tries to maintain. And, and this is where I think the common roots of Charlotte and Krefeld as um, textile centers that have undergone structural change gives you a common history um, and something to, to build. But, but I guess the, the question is sort of, are there metrics for measuring the success of a sister city relationship? I think if you, if you, there could be certainly, um, you know, one of the things that we Americans always recognize about ourselves that we're not good at is things like apprenticeships and that Germany is, is the gold standard in how to build an apprenticeship. And we do have some of those um, op opportunities that companies like Siemens have brought to our region. 
a metric I would love to see is a growth in the number of apprenticeships, uh, either with our international um, uh, direct investment companies here in the region or as a result of them. So within our community colleges, more resources to, um, to build it, to partnering with manufacturing companies, advanced technology companies to provide apprenticeships uh, would be a great metric if you just focused on the, the, the convergence of education and workforce development, that would be a great one uh, right there. So from a business standpoint, yeah, and I think there's- I'm very, I'm very happy that you raised um, the, the point of, of apprenticeships because um, one of our, our viewers uh, wrote a comment that, that Charlotte has been incredibly successful with its German style apprenticeship um, and is asking you know, whether there are opportunities to maybe um, build out the relationship between Charlotte and Krefeld in this specific area of workforce development and workforce preparedness. I, I like the idea. I think we should, absolutely. <laughs> we have workforce development is on the city and we're very focused on providing training opportunities to especially to people that don't have uh, maybe the access to go to college, maybe they to, but they don't have the resources to and providing these kinds of uh, apprenticeship opportunities. We are fortunate and we're fortunate that we have that here in Charlotte because of the German companies that are here, I believe. But it is a harder thing culturally to grow in the United States. So I, I think- um, Mayor Meyer. Yeah, I, I think um, that um, if we get the chance to, to come together um, personally in uh, 2021, it would be very interesting to um, for our side to do it uh, together, for example, with the um, um, Chamber of Commerce, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. To, um, to, to bring in um, the business too, because uh, they can uh, help us to, to finance um, on one hand and they, yes, <laughs> that's the way it is. And on the other hand, um, they can get something from it because they are very interested in international contact. And for us, it's, um, much more interesting to, um, um, if we talk about uh, other countries, not to talk about the whole country. Krefeld is too small to, um, <clears throat> to try to um, be shown all over the United States. But in, in North Carolina and in Charlotte, it would be very interesting because we have this relationship to, to present what uh, businesses we have here and what business contacts um, can be built up on our um, city's partnership. So um, I would be very interested to to bring in um, our department for business and international uh, activities, which is one uh, department here in uh, our city's administration, and um, to ask um, local businesses to uh, to join and uh, to um, to support us um, in uh, in doing more together. In the, in the future. But on the other hand, um, um, it's not only business. I think education and uh, cultural aspects are um, as important as business is because this is um, what brings us together on the long road. And uh, that uh, is a very good base, a fundament of uh, co-working, not only for a year or two, but for generations when we do a good job. Yeah, I completely agree. So with I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. The, the I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you mentioned the the long run because I think that these relationships are an investment uh, in the future. And uh, actually, my my colleague Rob Fenstermacher just sent a note, sort of riffing off of of what you're doing in Krefeld, Charlotte Krefeld Perspektivwechsel. Neudenken for the next third. So thinking afresh about the sister city relationship um, for the next 35 years. In, in closing though, um, I'd like to pick up on a, a viewer question that has to do with youth because I think in youth is investing in the future and in the future of this relationship. And one of our viewers is curious whether you can share with us 
some um, youth-led initiatives that you've seen in your communities that don't necessarily have to do with the sister city relationship, but they might, but youth-led initiatives that have inspired you um, or given you confidence in the next generation? What do you see young people doing that inspires you? How can that help us build the transatlantic bridge? Okay, <clears throat> for example, we have, a, we, have, we, have a, we have a very, very um, good working youth council, um, youngsters from, um, from schools um, that um, join together to be um, representatives of the um, young citizens for the whole city. And uh, they have uh, very, very, um, very good um, projects that they work on. Um, that has to deal with um, strengthen our democracy, our local democracy, uh, working against uh, racism for an um, open-minded um, society. And I think these are the best values young people can, can work for. And I think these are international values that we share on both sides of the Atlantic, that we share in Charlotte and in Krefeld. And um, so um, I think it's... Uh, uh, it's very important to bring these youngsters together um, so that they can cooperate and um, can be inspired by each other. Yeah, I think um, one of my favorite things to do is to talk to our youth organization that reach out. And um, I always remind them that as a local government elected official, what we're doing today isn't really going to benefit my generation so much. We are growing a city that they're going to live with either the benefits or the consequences of. And so even though some of them aren't old enough to vote and a lot of times they, they sort of say, well, I'm sorry, but I always say, don't be, because even though you're not old enough to vote, your voice is really important because we've got to look at the long-term um, when we, when we talk about racial equity, when we talk about infrastructure investment, whatever we're doing is really for generations from now. Um, we have a great organization here called Generation Nation that is made up of high school students from all over the, all over the um, school district. Uh, they get involved, they come and they come to city council meetings, county commission meetings, school board meetings. They have meetings with our police chief they have meetings on every topic and the, and the students really go deep. And they, I see that they build confidence in working with elected officials and with civic leaders. Um, and they've had a big impact. They let us know how they feel. They let us know what they want. They've gotten involved in the climate change issue. They've gotten involved in social justice. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's fantastic. I think we're all better off if our young people feel that they have a voice in shaping the city that we need to become. Well, that's a great place to end it. And I have to tell you both, I have rarely had an hour that has passed as quickly as the last hour with both of you. So thank you both very much, Mayor Pro Tem Julie Eiselt from Charlotte and Oberbürgermeister Frank Meyer from Krefeld. This has been delightful. Thank you both for, for taking the time to be with us. Thanks, I'd Steve. also like to thank the Welcome. staff in the, the mayor's offices um, in, in Charlotte and Krefeld and the World Affairs Council of Charlotte for partnering with us. As I mentioned at the outset, the World Affairs Council of Charlotte is helping support the revitalization of the Charlotte Sister Cities Association. And for those of you who are interested in Charlotte's Sister City Connections, tomorrow evening at 7 p.m., Charlotte Sister Cities will be hosting a live forum focused on Charlotte's relationship with Araquipa, and perhaps more importantly, for those of you who are on this call and are interested in Krefeld, Charlotte Sister Cities has a new website highlighting Krefeld and is working on collaborating with friends in Krefeld to ensure that it is an evolving resource for citizens to get to know each other and to learn more about each other. And next month on November 13th, the Charlotte Sister Cities Association will host a similar platform or event um, on its partnership with Krefeld. And you can learn about these events at cltsistercities.org. But for now, um, thank you both um, very much. And thanks to our viewers for weighing in with questions and comments.
Thank you all. Thank you. Goodbye.